I'm holding a book up, and I have enjoyed this book tremendously. It is Casey Stengel, baseball's greatest character, with a picture of Casey Stengel. And the, the picture uh, brings a very warm-hearted memory to me. There was a book that Jimmy Breslin did when I was in junior high school called, Can Anybody Here Play This Game? And I would take it out of the library and I would hold up Casey's face to scare girls and they would be scared. But in, in any event, um, I am so happy to be joined by this gentleman, the author of the book, Marty Appel. Marty has, as we were speaking before, a long, long, long list of baseball books. Marty has had a long career in baseball. And this book is an, really a joy for any baseball fan, old or new, and I'm so pleased to have Marty. We can talk about the book. Marty, how are you? Thank you for being with us. You're welcome. Good to be with you. And the photo on this book could probably also scare girls. <laughs> what caused you to write about old case? Um, actually, the impetus for it came a few years ago when MLB Network did a series called Prime 9, where they've named the best baseball movie and things like that. And they named Casey Stengel as the greatest character in baseball history. So my editor in, at Doubleday and I had a conversation about that, realizing it had been 35 years since the last major Casey book had come out, and that a lot of people had kind of forgotten who Casey Stengel was. Mm -hmm. So we thought it would be an interesting project. And sure enough, as I was doing it, I didn't meet too many people under 40 who had even heard of Casey Stengel. So um, that was really an incentive to, to bring him back to life, so to speak. And to those people under 40, who was Casey Stengel? Where was he born? How did he get started in the game of baseball? Well, he spent 55 years in professional baseball starting in 1910 as a minor league player and concluding in 1965 uh, as the New York Mets' first manager. And in 1966, they kind of rushed him into the Hall of Fame because he was at an advanced age. Mm -hmm. But he lived 85 years. He most famously managed the Yankees to 10 pennants and 7 world championships in 12 years got fired by the Yankees after losing a seven-game World Series and got signed by the Mets to put them on the map, which he more than did. Um, his accomplishments before that were scattered. He was never a very successful manager before the Yankees. He was an above-average player, but he wasn't going to go to Cooperstown on his playing skills. And he was a... Um at one point, he actually thought about being a dentist. Is this true? Well, it's true. His parents wanted him to have a backup career just in case baseball didn't work out. So in his hometown of Kansas City was a dental college, and he enrolled there, and he went there for three off-seasons until he decided it wasn't for him because they really didn't make left-handed dental equipment, and he was a lefty. The irony of that to me, which I say in the book, is how did it take them so long to come to that conclusion? <laughs> You'd think they would have figured that out on the first day, right? <laughs> now, in, in researching Casey, I, I would imagine you had to do some incredible digging just given the amount of time. You know, he's uh, been deceased 42 years, I believe. Yeah, he died in 1975. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty good at research. It's the part of the book that I enjoy the most because I, I know where to go for things. So if I'm writing a paragraph and I know I need to describe somebody in it, I know where to go, and that's fun for me. Um, what I had available to me that Bob Creamer didn't have 35 years ago, and he wrote the last major Casey book, was the Internet. Um, I was able to go to the digital files of old newspapers in the minor league towns where Casey played as a young man, mm -hmm. dig up anecdotes that had long been forgotten, 
and the Stengel family gave me an unpublished memoir by Casey's wife, Edna, that she wrote in 1958, which shows a whole other side of the man. We all, we all just knew him as a baseball figure, but there was a side that was a husband, and the two of them never had any children, so she traveled with him extensively. She was the first lady of every team he managed, and she was a great companion for him, and they had a marriage of almost 50 years. Was she a baseball fan? Oh, she became one. She would keep box score at her seat. She would wait for him after the game was over and talk to all the players' wives and anybody else who was passing through. So she did, uh, you know, couldn't, you could barely help it because Casey had no hobbies. He was all baseball 365 days a year. He didn't go to movies. He didn't play golf. He didn't go hunting or fishing. He had no hobbies. He was just baseball. He was a baseball man. Edna had a career, I think, somewhere along the way, uh, I might have, where she was in pictures? Eh, not really. She, her father was an investor in a, in a motion picture company, and she spent a few days as an extra in some scenes. That story got exaggerated along the way. <laughs> It's it, it's an amazing thing. Well, his managerial career, I mean, it kind of started, well, I don't know, I guess the best thing, uh, the way you describe it in the book was kind of unremarkable. It was unremarkable. Um, he had played ball in high school, baseball, football, and basketball. He um, played a few years in the minors, beginning with a team in Kankakee, Illinois, that was known as the Lunatics. <laughs> It's such, such an amazing journey. He hit the first World Series home run in Yankee Stadium? That's right. From before that, he hit the first home run ever in Ebbets Field in 1913. Now, 10 years later, he hit the first ever in, uh, World Series home run in the new Yankee Stadium in 1923. And being Casey Stengel, it was not without an adventure. He had a... Um, a foot injury, and there was a, like a rubber padding put inside his shoe. Mm -hmm. And as he was running, he was already considered an old man. And as he was running, he was yelling out loud, Go, Casey! Go, Casey! as he was passing the infielders. So they were kind of laughing, but he was chugging along. <laughs> this rubber pad flew out of the shoe. He thought he lost his shoe. So uh, he slid home. And he said to the on-deck hitter, Hank Gowdy, I lost my shoe. And Hank Gowdy looked down and he said, well, how many were you wearing, Casey? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, just thinking if I could have heard a conversation between Casey and Babe Ruth, that had to be one for the ages. Well, they knew each other and Babe Ruth came to Casey's and Edna's wedding party and, um, they played against each other in the 1916 World Series when Babe Ruth was a pitcher for Boston. It's it, it it's just it, it's just such an amazing life. He makes his way. You know, when when you think of Casey Stengel, if if you take it from my perspective, okay, I started to get interested in baseball about 1962 and Casey was managing the Mets of somewhat comical older man uh, who was a character and people would say but he was a Yankee manager a Yankee manager and then when you read about what he had done you like you had just mentioned as far as his exemplary career how did he get there and how did the players view him was he a clown was he a genius was he a, or could you and I have managed that club maybe you more than me <laughs> Yankees? The Yankees. Well, he came with the reputation of being a second division manager on a lot of bad National League teams and a bit of a clown because of all of these stories like the flying shoe that followed him. Um, 
but he also had a lot of self-confidence. He knew he was a smart baseball man, and he wanted this shot at managing a good team just to show he what he could do. So he took over the Yankees. There was a lot of skepticism that this guy could manage Joe DiMaggio and these other great players. And sure enough, he overcomes 71 injuries that first season by the team and wins the World Series. So all doubts were closed with that victory in that World Series. But then he goes on to win four more to give him five in a row, a feat never before done and never since done. Uh, well, his ticket to Cooperstown was punched. He was, uh, he was now considered one of the great geniuses of baseball history. And how did the players view him? Did they view him as, did they take him seriously? Did they take him very seriously? Did, or, uh, I, because I've seen all sides of this man and I still, and I think the great part of your book is, I really don't know quite how to take him even so. He was pretty serious managing the Yankees. Uh, he lost the seriousness when he talked to fans or talked to the press mm-hmm. and give them a little stangalese. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Talk. Um, but in clubhouse meetings and during the game in the dugout, he was all business. He was very serious. And he liked to establish that he was the boss. He even kind of drew a line in the sand with Joe DiMaggio telling all his players in his first spring training that they couldn't go to the dog track. And everybody who knew DiMaggio knew that's what he did. He loved it. So it was like, this was some challenge. What happened was that DiMaggio defied him, went to the dog track anyway. And when Casey was asked about it, he just said, well, I wasn't there. I have no firsthand knowledge of this, so I have no comment. So it kind of was a stalemate that neither side won. Well, DiMaggio won. He was going to the dog track. But um, could you imagine this today? There'd be 2,500 uh, cell phone pictures of DiMaggio at the dog <laughs> track, and the newspaper headlines would be saying, your move, Casey. But now, Casey. <laughs> now, you mentioned Stingleese, and if you were to define Stingleese, I'm going to ask you to do that. And yeah. perhaps I think the greatest, shall we say, uh, example of Stingleese was Casey's congressional testimony. <laughs> if, if you could tell us about that. It was a form of double talk, sort of consisting mostly of run on sentences through which he would avoid answering a question or stall for time until he could think of the answer that he was looking for. He most famously used it when he was called to testify before a congressional committee looking into baseball's antitrust exemption. Nobody knew what the questions were going to be, but whatever they first asked Casey, it didn't matter. What he was prepared was to tell his life story in one run-on sentence. (laughs) Until he had all the senators on the committee laughing. It was really a comical moment in in congressional history, uh, underscored by the fact that when he was done, Mickey Mantle went. And Mickey said... Well, my answers are just about the same as Casey's. <laughs> the house down. <laughs> it's it's it, it, it's an amazing thing, and he was ah uh, uh, just 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 such a character. I'll tell you something, Tony. The um, I read the audio version of the book. I'd never done anything quite like that before. And at the end, I did some interviews, and somebody said. Uh, you've never done this before. Did you find anything particularly difficult about it? And I said, yes, reading the Stengelese. <laughs> <laughs> Try that someday. <laughs> it's, it, it really is. I mean, when you take that in today's context, it's just so unthinkable with baseball. Uh, Marty, you still here? I'm here. Okay, great. I, uh, I I was laughing so much I knocked over our audio. But the uh, the amazing thing is we get to 1959 and 1960. We're topping and Webb uh, trying to get Casey out or trying to get a way to get him out in the 1960 series was the perfect storm to do it. Or did that all kind of happen at the end, beginning with when 
Kubek uh, was hit by the uh, the ball off the pebble in Pittsburgh in Game Seven. Stuff happened in that World Series that still makes it one of the most memorable World Series ever played. But the real bottom line on that whole scenario was they didn't want to lose Ralph Houck. He was the manager in waiting. Everybody felt he was going to be a great manager, and he did win three straight pennants as soon as he took over. But Houck had offers from Boston and Detroit. And Yankee management was just saying, you know, we could stay with Casey another year, another two years. He's in his 70s now, but we'll lose Halk in the process. So they decided, and they say they would have done it even if the Yankees had won, to institute this retirement system to let Casey ride off into the sunset and Ralph Halk take over. Well, Casey didn't ride off quietly. He was very angry about being fired and always stayed that way for the rest of his life. But it was a good baseball move. They got the much younger man, Ralph Houck, in, won three pennants. The year before, 1959, the team did the same thing on the field, and Casey certainly had no problem with that. And what I'm referring to is they traded their old right fielder, Hank Bauer, for the much younger right fielder, Roger Maris. And we know how that worked out. Mm-hmm. And Casey had no problem with that, with that. When you mention Casey, and just going to back up a little bit, I've, uh, I've never spoken to uh, Jerry Coleman. I have had the privilege of speaking to Bobby Richardson. And Bobby said playing for Casey was an entirely frustrating exercise because he never knew where he would bat or he never knew if he was batting down the order, if he would be pinch hit before his first at bat. And I uh, w- was there kind of a underlying frustration with the Yankee players there as to what what is the old man going to do to us today? Well, he was not an easy guy to play for. I mean, as great as his record is, players didn't love him. Um, the ones who played for McCarthy and Stengel preferred McCarthy, and the ones who played for Stengel and Hauk preferred Hauk. Uh, nevertheless, none of them had a problem when it came time to cashing their World Series check. No, that's for sure. Now, he's out of baseball in 1961, and does he think he's out for good, and how does he find himself with an expansion team in New York? Um, he had offers to manage the Angels, who were starting up in 61, and the Giants, who were searching for a manager and signed Alvin Dark when Casey turned them down. So the opportunities were there. He took 61 off because he got a lot of money to write an autobiography. Mm -hmm. So that was his project for the year. Then George Weiss became the president of the Mets. He had been Casey's boss with the Yankees. Right. Not involved in the firing. He was retired, too. And he reached out to Casey and said, we could use you here. We really need to put this franchise on the map. Um, Can we implore on you to come and give us a year or two managing just to establish our our roots here? The other thing that appealed to Casey was sticking it to the Yankees. It was a chance to compete for fans in New York. And everything he did, that was sort of in the back of his mind. Uh, Like, uh, I'm taking attention away from the Yankees on the back of mm-hmm. the tabloids. So uh, he was enjoying that a lot. It's, um, and then we had the whole new breed and the fact of people embracing this team that was losing dramatically, and Casey was almost the comical face of that, at least as I recall. And uh, did he find the losing difficult? He barely paid attention, to be honest with you. His job was to entertain the writers, to woo the fans, to talk about the future, the uh, young kids who will grow up saying Metsies, Metsies, Metsies as their first words. (laughs) Um, And he succeeded royally in that. For the team on the field, he knew it was not very good. Uh, He let his coaches run the games. Sally Hemis and Cookie Lavagetto, they did the lineups, they did the pitching rotation. Casey would be known to snooze in the dugout a little bit during the games. And even on the field, his center fielder, Richie Ashburn, kind of ran the game from the field. So Casey became a completely different manager 
between 60 when he left the Yankees and 62 when he joined the Mets. And he follows the team to their new ballpark, Shea Stadium. And team's improving a little bit every year. Um, hopeful sign here, hopeful sign there. Farm player here, farm player there. And uh, he finds himself in a predicament uh, where he injures himself and then has to leave the game. And was that, uh, when that happened, and I'd like for you to describe that, uh, was, was that a time when the Mets front office said, ah, finally we got rid of him? It might have been a little bit of that. The fans were growing restless. They'd been in the last place every year. Casey had started, well, as I say, he wasn't that engaged with the team, but there were five or six players by the time he left that would go on to be part of the 69 world champion Mets. Uh, but yeah, there was probably a feeling that Every man has had his time, (laughs) and this was Casey's. (laughs) The one journalist in New York who never bought into Casey's act was uh, Howard Cosell. Howard Cosell, yeah. Who, starting with the very first year, was always railing about, uh, Mets have got to grow up and get rid of this clown and take this game more seriously. And people weren't buying Cosell, but Cosell was right. Um, By 65, Casey had achieved maybe his ultimate dream, he was out drawing the Yankees with the opening of Shea Stadium in 64. Um, As for what finally happened, it was a little bit like the Cassius Clay punch that knocked out Sonny Liston in Lewiston, Maine, where nobody actually saw it. Uh, He took a fall after an old-timers party at the the Mets' old-timers day. It was variously reported as in the men's room, in the driveway of this Mets controller where Casey had gone to spend the night. But in any case, he broke his hip. That's pretty serious at 75. Sure. Uh, He couldn't function as the manager anymore. He couldn't go up and down the dugout steps. So it was time, and the torch was passed over to Wes Westrom, who succeeded him. Yeah, who was a... A, a, a solid baseball man, kind of the precursor to Gil Hodges. Yeah, Hodges was the key. Once they got Hodges, all of a sudden, people took them seriously. Now, Casey goes back to retire, and what is his retirement like? Is he like the, uh, uh, sh- shall we say, the general without a war to fight? Is he miserable? Is he finding his way? What's happening with him? He was just enjoying life being Casey Stengel. He liked being a celebrity. He liked being recognized. He liked going to the supermarket and talking to the people. His phone number and his address were listed in the Glendale, California phone book, and he loved when people just knocked on the door for autographs. So he would go to everybody's old-timers day, everybody's winter banquet. He'd go to Cooperstown every year, and he just enjoyed being Casey Stengel. Now... Did he, uh, and, and, and you, I, I believe, would have uh, first-hand knowledge of this, did he finally reconcile with the Yankees and the Yankees reconcile with him? Not really. He finally agreed to go back to Old Timers Day, which is Chapter 1 in the book. Um, because Bob Fischel, the PR man for the Yankees, the one who hired me to do mm-hmm. PR for the Yankees, uh, he kind of pleaded with Casey, and then he signed a letter saying, Case, if you come back, we'd love to retire your number. Well, Casey understood the baseball culture better than most people, and he knew that was a really big deal, especially in 1970. Today, you know, there's hundreds of numbers retiring. Sure, yeah, the Yankees will go to three digits at some point. (laughs) Yeah, it looks that way, but in 19... and Mantle had had their numbers retired Mm -hmm. so they were saying to Casey we want you to be the fifth well that appealed to him he knew his baseball history and he knew the ceremonial part of it so he agreed to go back and he went back four other times for the rest of his life Uh, and I was by then the PR guy who would always arrange for his travel and accommodations and everything that he needed any personal recollections of Casey that stand out? My best one was from that first year when we really bent over backwards to show him a great time. He had a great time. And when he went home to Glendale, 
This was so old school, but it was funny. All the old timers got gifts. That's just typical and traditional. I remember. Clock radios that year. Anyway, Casey goes home, and on a postcard, which anybody could read, it wasn't sealed, on an old postcard in this big, scrawling handwriting, he just addresses it to New York Yankees, Yankee Stadium, Bronx, New York, and on the message side, he wrote, he wrote, Mrs. Stengel and I had a marvelous time, great to see old friends, expense report will follow, and thank you for my prize. <laughs> <laughs> he called it a prize. Isn't that precious? <laughs> I, I still remember it all these years later. It's it, it's an amazing thing, and I understand uh, Billy and Casey had a a closeness. Then they had a falling out, and then later they became friends. Can you talk about that for a moment? Well, the later part wasn't really accurate. There was a schism there. When Billy was Casey's boy, it says that on his plaque in Monument Park. Mm -hmm. uh, Casey managed him in the minors, brought him to the Yankees, even though he was very un-Yankee-like, because the Yankees never liked flashy guys. Uh, I never saw a player play so above his ability as I did with Billy Martin. Once he put on the uniform, he was Superman. When he eventually went to other teams, we saw the real Billy Martin, which was a guy of just ordinary skills. With the Yankees, he was a World Series star. He was terrific. Anyway, he was forever linked with Casey. And then in 1957, celebrating his birthday at the Copacabana nightclub in New York, the Yankee players got into a brawl with uh, some patrons who were at the nightclub that night. Management was very embarrassed that this was called covered in the newspaper, and within a few weeks, Billy got traded. Well, he never forgave Casey for not standing up and stopping that trade and protecting him. So he didn't speak to Casey for practically the rest of Casey's life. But when asked about it, Casey would just say, ah, tell Billy Martin to grow up. This is the profession he chose. People get traded all the time. Uh, grow up and accept it. It was no big deal. It was to Billy, but uh, Casey just saw it as business. People do get traded all the time. I, I, I didn't know that, and uh, thank you for bringing that out, because history does paint a slightly different version. I can't believe it. We're out of time, and I'm going to hold your fine book up to the camera here. Casey Stengel, Baseball's Greatest Character. Marty, where can our friends and fans and other friends and fans buy this great book? Well, wherever fine books are sold, as the saying goes. <laughs> um, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, independent bookstores, which I love and I hope they thrive. Um, so any traditional way in which you purchase a book, you can find Casey Stengel. And I'm telling them to read it. Marty, best success as always and continued success with the book. And I'm sure we'll be talking again. God blessing us both and you stay well. And thank you so much for being here tonight. Great to be on. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Good night. Good night. And that was Marty Appel and his book, Casey Stengel, Baseball's Greatest Character. We're going to be winding it out and we will come right back with an announcement. Stay tuned. It's not the pale moon that excites me that thrills and delights me. Oh no, it's just the nearness of you. It isn't your sweet conversation. sensation oh no it's just the near